And this is a fellow by the name of Bill Smith. And the reason I put Bill up here is because even when this process sort of fails, you can still have success within a company. Now he works for Taleo, where not everybody inside of Taleo does this process. But he started a new division in his company in the small to medium sector marketplace from nothing, and they're now closing 200 new customers on a quarterly basis. And that's even in this economy. So he's, he's got a lot more transactions than most of our customers, so I put him up here as an example, because I knew we had companies that really spanned the globe here in the sector, across a lot of sectors, out in the audience tonight. So this is about economic recovery and how to get your share. Now, would anybody believe that you could close nine out of 10 or win nine out of 10 of anything? Well, we in this state know there is such a person in such an organization, don't we? I don't know if you remember this, but this man won nine out of every 10 playoff games he was ever in. That's a pretty good accomplishment, isn't it? By the way, this slide plays a lot better here than it does in Illinois or any place <laughs> else. <laughs> so how do you do that? I don't know if you're like me and you read books, and I've read all the best sales books. One of the things they always told me to do was get to the person we call power early. So who is power? Power is the person that can buy even without a budget. That's the simple way that, that we chose to define it. Now, if you have a long sales cycle and it's dramatized sort of in this graphic here by the number of weeks that it takes, and whatever your steps are, these may be your steps, they may, they may not be, but if it takes you a long time to get to power, and you do all this work, all this time with all these resources, and you get to power here, ever find out that power isn't interested? After all this work and all this time, it happens, doesn't it? Or ever been confused or, or belittled by believing that the person you're working with was power and it wasn't? It can be painful. This is about moving power up to the front end. And all the good books say to do that. But to do that, you've got to earn the right to speak to power. So this is about developing your zebra as the first piece. And I'm going to share with you what that darn thing is in a second. It's about figuring out the value your solution creates and then staying in that group and developing your talk track, your business development. There's been a lot of talk about business development, but developing your business development around the critical business issues that you solve at this position and predicting the value that you can create at this level. And when you do that, and you have your first meeting at power, and you stay with your zebras, you'll have a unique hit ratio increase. And when you meet with power early on, I don't know what the steps will become. I do know, however, they will change. And a lot of these steps will go away. Especially if you create a no-go decision, go, no-go decision right here, where you give power everything they need to make a decision. When you do that and you say, these are the business issues I solve, this is the value that I can create, I can demonstrate that, I've done it here, here, and here, and I have a process that will verify that for your business, are you interested? Will you partner with me? It's a pretty simple message, really, isn't it? If they decide to partner, you verify that value with people that power trusts. You co-author a business case with permission to present it back to power. You ask him for a decision. You negotiate, you close it, and you do one more step. You force success. Force success means You've got everything built in to make sure that the promises that are made are actually achieved. And then you claim that success and you complete the process. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. Zebras have been in my past for a long time. Before we called it a zebra, I started doing this back in the 80s when I worked for a small computer company that none of you ever heard of. And we competed with companies at that time like IBM, HP, and Digital Equipment Corporation. And to survive, 
we had to figure out why companies would bet their business on a no-name computer company called MAI Basic 4. Then we did it again in 1993 when I worked for a company called Bon. Anybody here ever heard of Bon? B-A-A-N, Enterprise Resource Planning, ERP space. When I started with Bon, I was the fifth person hired in the U.S. Our competition was SAP and Oracle, two very large companies. There were a lot of other competitors at that time, but SAP and Oracle was in on every deal. And the conversation would always start out with a prospect where he'd say, I am Jeff from Bond, and they would say, did you say Bond? <laughs> say, no, B-A-A-N, and they'd say, oh, where are you from? Well, we're headquartered in the Netherlands. Would you bet your business on a business that was headquartered in the Netherlands when you could buy from multi-billion dollar companies? That was the backdrop, and we had to figure out how to get to power with business issues that mattered in an environment where it was bet your business decision. But by doing that, we reduced our sales cycles, we increased our average deal size, and we increased our pipeline close rate, and we were successful. When I left Bond five years later, we were three quarters of a billion, and we had 6,000 people. So I've helped do these, these ideas and principles. These aren't just theories. And since then, we've had selling to Zebra's business for 11 years, and, it's, and it seems to work. What is a zebra? A zebra is your perfect prospect. And it's based on seven identifiable attributes. It's the type of company or organization where you fit particularly well. So it's things like demographics, which you'd expect, possibly sit codes, those types of things. But it's also about culture and about fit. It's about operations. What do the, your customers look like operationally? And in that one lies the critical business issues that your solution solves for them. By figuring out the critical business issues you solve and the value you create, you earn the right to penetrate companies that have operational issues of that type. So these, these first two are in strategic order. The third is power. Who's the key decision maker for companies that can buy from you even if there isn't a budget? Fourth is classic, it's funding. What's the level of funding for your perfect customer? We're gonna define perfection on every one of these attributes. Perfection doesn't actually exist, but we're gonna define perfection. Then we're gonna measure all other prospects against perfection to determine how close we need to be to know we're gonna win. Do you remember Pat's number? What number does Pat need to know he's going to win? 23. 23, exactly. My son, who's co-author of the book, said he always called that the Be Like Mike number. Remember Michael Jordan's ad? He's number 23, Be Like Mike, back way back when. Fifth is value. What level of value or ROI do you have to prove for your best prospects to buy? Sixth is technology. Now, technology is unique. It's a double-edged sword. Even those of you who might sit back and say, wait a minute, I'm in government. What does technology have to do with it? Well, one of our customers is an excavation company. They move dirt. What does technology have to do with moving dirt? Well, actually, they have GPSs in all their trucks. So they know what's underneath the ground. They know the exact coordinates of where they're going. They know what's above the ground. In fact, S.C. Johnson is one of their customers, and they know that those facts better than their customer does. That's a technology advantage, isn't it? Even non-technology fields have technology that comes into play for you or for your competition, and that's why it's a double-edged sword. So what technology benefits you and what technology benefits your, your competition? And finally, there's service. What level of service would your best customer contract for and pay for. Now these are in strategic order. These are the seven elements of virtually any deal, whether you're public sector, private sector, B2C or B2B. But if you figure this out and then you learn how to start scoring it and strategizing with it, you can improve your hit rates, your deal size, 
and collapse your sales cycles. Now this is what it actually looks like. This is a picture, and I've, I've done this presentation where I've had a room full of CEOs actually create their zebra all at the same time. And one of the things they told me early on was, Jeff, show me the darn thing. Show me what it looks like. This is actually what it looks like. So this is actually a cut and paste of a spreadsheet. And then we automate this in, in, a, in a CRM called salesforce.com, if anybody's familiar with that. But if you look, here's the seven attributes that we were just talking about. And then what we do is we define the anti-zebra, if you will. It's kind of a red light, green light, stop light, go light system. So red is bad, red is stop, yellow is caution, green is go. And we go from the anti-zebra here, if you will. In other words, what are the companies or organizations where I, would, I just flat out know I would lose, they're not a good fit, and then all the way through the seven attributes. So what is zero? We define zero so that we can know what a four, we, we can contrast that with a four. Sometimes we know better what we do do well at or do want by looking at what we don't want. We're kind of built that way, aren't we, for contrast. A four is perfection. Now, there's not a perfect prospect out there such that you would get a perfect score.